Welcome to another episode of Crime Pays with Bonnie Doesn't. Greetings from Brooklyn. Specifically, we're here at the Floyd Bennett Field, an abandoned, uh, defunct uh, landing strip, airstrip. You can see they're probably just storing planes here. Maybe it was parking for cars, but probably it was parking for planes. And uh, it's been slowly overtaken <clears throat> by a number of invasive and native species. A lot of invasives, okay? Like this uh, this onion, this sedum down here, this little, this little succulent. This is sedum album. But uh, what's remarkable about this spot is because all the pavement is still left intact, it's created a very specific environment and optimal growing conditions for anything that can tolerate uh, this dry microsite, which is what it, what it is. I mean, it's, you know, the Atlantic coast is primarily, uh, you know, heavily vegetated, heavily wooded, but what we've created here is an artificial rocky habitat. And so we get a lot of succulent plants and uh, ironically, two species of cactus in the genus Opuntia, the genus of prickly pears, that are thriving here. So let's go check them out. Okay, so just start with this little patch. We'll just take a look at uh, the different species composition we got right here. We got that sedum crassulaceae, the family, namesake family for crassulaceae and acid metabolism, whereby plants do their photosynthesis uh, during the day in a closed system with those leaf stomata closed, those microscopic gas pores closed. They take in carbon at night, okay, and then store it in the form of malic acid or malate, uh, close their stomata then in the morning when the sun comes out and, and just photosynthesize using the carbon that they fixed earlier that night. Cacti do the same thing, okay? Uh, cra this is, again, Crassulaceae is the family, Saxophragellus is the order. There's Sedum album, and there is Sedum, uh, Sedum sarmentosum. Both of those uh, invasive they're uh, one's from Europe, one's from Asia, but uh, they seem to be thriving here. Also from Asia is this onion, Allium tuberosum. Those are the little fruits, three carpeled fruits. They are a monocot, so we're talking multiples of three in reference to floral parts and fruits. And what the shit? You can see these have mostly gone to uh, these have mostly gone to fruit right here. There's the flowers, but they are the true onion. Okay, so you got a nice, you got a nice little bulb in the ground right there. There's those flowers when they're going off. You can see the ovary, uh, which is not maturing yet, just waiting to get pollinated right there. That little green three carpal thing. Petals later fall off upon pollination, and you end up with one of these little capsules and tons of uh, tiny black seeds, which you could see readily find the home in these uh, little cracks and shit. You know, for these cracks, and look at the decay and tar. That might be semi toxic. I certainly wouldn't eat anything from here. And moving on down, we got this guy, always a stalwart, always a common component of uh, New York City and generally East Coast. You get this a lot of this in uh, Chicago too, East Coast and Midwest invasive flora in the cities right there. We have Artemisia vulgaris. Okay, same genus is absinthe. Oh yeah, those leaves, they kind of smell good, but they kind of smell bad. Probably give you a headache if you had to whiff too many of them. Regardless, you can see why it thrives in these dry sites, growing out of pavement, asphalt, abandoned building uh, roofs, etc. It's got those white abaxial surfaces, tons of tiny hairs, prevent those stomata from transpiring too much moisture when it's hot. And then uh, it's got thousands of tiny flowers on it. What looks like a single flower right there is actually composed of many flowers. See, one of those things actually has quite a few flowers in it because this is a composite flower from the composite family, Asteraceae, all right? Same thing that's going on with sunflowers. All right, smells pretty funky. Kind of nice, kind of bad. Technically, it's the same genus as Great Basin Sagebrush, which also smells good, but some people find it nauseating, whatever. And you can see that Artemisia vulgaris is just thriving here. Doing very well for itself, becoming a common component, all right, in the center of these cracks in the pavement where all the other funky shit's growing. See that? Look at how the two different species of invasive sedum uh, have occupied different niches, okay? Obviously, where it's drier, because the moisture, this is, this is a big crack right here, all right? This is a big seam in these pavement slabs. That's gonna get more moisture. You could tap in once it breaks through, once the plants break through, you could tap into the actual soil, you're gonna get more moisture. But out here on the margin, further away from the center of that crack, uh, it's a little bit drier. And so sedum album can uh, obviously tolerate drier sites. This species of sedum can obviously tolerate drier sites. Look, it's flush and red. It's got those stress pigments in it. The leaves are smaller. It's a juicier plant, okay? It's more tolerant of drying out. It's got more storage in these leaves. See that? But over here, 
you look at sedum sarmentosum, you got a broader leaf, it's thinner, it's not storing as much juice, it's a little bit greener, doesn't have the benefit of those stress pigments, which mitigate the effects of heat and excess light, and so that's gonna need a little bit moisture of an environment, but almost like it was planted, okay? There's a nice assortment of garbage in here too, let's not lie, sometimes you like it, all right? It's fun to look through, cast a certain pallor, okay? Having garbage all over the place, does cast a certain pallor and being the cynic and uh, occasionally negative person that I am I do like seeing it okay okay in some ways the garbage on the ground is kind of like a fuck you all right which certainly I mean, fuck yous have a very uh, there's a time and a place for them you know anyway let's not fucking fill up you know philosophize too much let's just keep going and then of course we got our old friend Dawkus Carota Queen Anne's Lace okay wild carrot and it actually is a carrot probably the wild ancestor of, uh, of carrots. So it was probably this species uh, went through, you know, 10,000, 12,000 years of human selection pressure to produce the carrots that we have today in all their different colors, shapes, and sizes. Nice. Okay. You dig that root up, doesn't, I mean, it looks like a carrot, it looks like a skinny, you know, half assed carrot, but it's, you crack it open, it smells like a carrot. This is a carrot. Now you look at the flowers of any of the uh, cultivars of carrots that exist today, they're going to look just like this. I mean, slightly different, but same form, same uh, structure. And uh, when you look at the flowers, same flowers. The flowers, though, are tiny. This will hold hundreds of flowers, hundreds of tiny flowers. You can see it's done, but you got that compound umbel of uh, a family that was once known as umbeliferae, and it's now known as APAC, the carrot family. Ugh, you guys again. You guys are everywhere. Huh? You're everywhere. Fuck me. You're like dollar stores. Jesus, you're like the dollar store of insects, at least in this ecosystem. Down here we got Ambrosia artemisia folia, which looks a lot like that over there, or Artemisia vulgaris, which of course is an invasive species. This one is native. This is a native ragweed, okay? Look at those flowers. You got spikes versus over there you got those, those little uh, droopy things, all right? Tons of tiny little flowers that kind of, you know, kind of cascade down, kind of pendant thing going on but these are wind pollinated flowers primarily male flowers mostly staminate flowers that release pollen up top and then down towards the bottom you have uh female flowers that actually produce seeds okay ragweed's a pain in the ass for a lot of people who suffer from uh you know hay fever pollen allergies but it produces a great number of seeds for birds so this is basically like a living bird feeder but see it's just i mean they thrive here so it's a native it's cool to see finally a fucking native here Aside from uh, just that cactus, but let's go look. We're, we'll get to the cactus eventually. Let's keep look going this way. I got something else I want to show you. So cool. The natural stratification of these two seeds. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. Look, you got a nice, it's forming a mat with those roots just growing right on the pavement. So tolerant of drying out. I mean, yeah, it's an invasive, but still kind of cool to observe what's going on here. And then that sedum sarmentosum, just basically three, three succulent leaves on its stem. Needs a little bit more moisture. Oh, I see cactus. See that? Someone was stashing that there, and they're gonna take it later. It's got the fruits, the pink fruits on it, which are technically edible. All cactus fruits edible, just not necessarily palatable. Anyway, look at this stuff on the ground. Looks filthy, dirty. Looks messy. Maybe someone shit the bed. Massive diarrhea explosion. Maybe something caught fire. That certainly looks like a piece of burned tar, or maybe it's just old gasket, old asphalt from the seam, old gasket from a plain old. Yeah, it's old. You know what? No, it's old asphalt from the seams. So, anyway. This is actually alive, it's just dormant right now. This is a species of cyanobacteria, probably in the genus Nostoc. You can see it's this, this film kind of looks like seaweed, but upon getting wet within half an hour to an hour, it turns green and looks like slimy green snot and starts photosynthesizing again. And then just, uh, you know, once it dries out again, conditions are no longer favorable for its growth, it turns into this. Looks like, looks like a goddamn piece of nori or something from some high-end overpriced sushi restaurant. See that? But it's not dead. It's just dormant. This is what makes cyanobacteria so successful. And you got to give it to cyanobacteria because they produce the first oxygen in the world around, you know, started accumulating to any large extent about 2 billion years ago. And that's what of course caused the abandoned iron formations. <clears throat> but this is probably uh, fixing its own nitrogen too out of the atmosphere, like a lot of cyanobacteria can do. How does it do it? How does it do it? We don't know, but that's a big colony of a bunch of individual cells of the cyanobacteria Nostoc communis. Turns out I actually brought some echinacea seeds with me. This is an echinacea purpurea. 
So we're gonna take some of them seeds and we're gonna start a little colony in the cracks, okay? All this will slowly, you know, you give it 500, 1,000 years, you know, humanity probably won't be around anymore, at least not in any significant numbers. I have a feeling a bottleneck's gonna come soon with the way we fucked this planet into a coma. That said, 500 to 1,000 years, you know, that's how the degradation of this, uh, uh, these panels of uh, concrete are, is, is gonna go. Nature's gonna slowly reclaim, quote unquote, nature, AKA the plants are slowly gonna eat away at the margins, you know, starting at the seams of these panels, and then uh, slowly reclaim this, turn it into just a, a more rockier area of the surrounding region. But that's, uh, you can see what, what they're doing already. And I just get frost wedging mixed with the destruction of the material by the plant roots. So anyway, everything's starting in the seams, all right? That asphalt seam, uh, gets uh, decayed by the sun, blows away, and then the seeds get in there and start doing their magic. So I'm just going to go ahead and take some of these seeds, uh, this echinacea species, uh, and uh, this native echinacea species, and drop it in there. So, you know, hopefully they'll get established. All you need is two plants to get going, maybe even one. I think these maybe are self-fertile. Get one or two plants growing in there, and then you'll, you know, run the uh, potential of establishing a new population this uh, Echinacea purpurea. So yeah, well, let's hope we'll see. See there you go. Just get them started. Just put them in there right there. Put some rocks around it, nice so they don't blow around by the wind. Maybe a rat will come through and eat all of them. Maybe not. Who knows? We'll see. But you got to get them seeds out of that main uh, that main head. Probably hundred seeds in this head right there. We're gonna hedge our bets. You could see this is slowly building soil here. These roots are trapping particles, a mixture of uh, the decaying asphalt along with old vegetative matter, and they're slowly building a little mound, little island of soil, which seems more amenable than the cracks uh, to uh, to sow seeds. And so we're gonna hedge our best, we're gonna try everything, just start putting native seeds out here. And eventually, uh, you know, if someone were doing this enough, you'd get established native populations, which would hopefully outcompete uh, the invasives, or at least compete with them. Oh, look at that nice, so what is that, dead rat? No, look at that. Of course, how could we not be here and talk about the massive colonies of cactus of native cactus, native prickly pears, Opuntia humifusa and Opuntia cespitosa, or Opunti if you want to pronounce like that, that are growing here, thriving on this artificially uh, rocky environment. Okay, they're growing as lithophytes, all right, able to tolerate the basically a lack of soil and, uh, you know, just hang in there. They got those storage mechanisms, they got crass lacy and acid metabolism. So basically, you know, acquiring carbon, you know, taking carbon in at night and then photosynthesizing during the day, doing a, you know, closing your stomata during the day. They're just thriving here. Big yellow flowers. Every big yellow flower they produce eventually produces a fruit. If it's pollinated, one of those red fruits looking conspicuous to birds, that's why they're red. Birds and other mammals that would hopefully disperse them. But look at those glockids on there. See out of the aerials, this doesn't have spines, at least not right now. It can, it can have a single spine out of those arrows, but it's got those glockids, okay? Those glockids are like little fiberglass hairs and they're a trademark of this specific family of the cactus family. Cactus family is cactaceae. This specific subfamily is Opuntioidae. Opuntioides, the Opuntioids after the genus Opuntia, okay? Opunchas, the prickly pears, and cylinder punches, the choys, and a handful of other species, especially some really rare ones in South America, all do this. They'll produce glockids, all right? And they have a different kind of seed from uh, the rest of the cactus family seeds as well, all right? These look like a little flake. The rest of the cactus family seeds generally look like a little black poppy seed. That said, there's supposed to be two different species here. I don't know who did the genetic work. They all look the fucking same to me. The only difference is in flowers. The uh, cispitosas have a yellow flower with a red center. Humifusa has a yellow center. And then supposedly one produces spines. Cispitosa and the Humifusa doesn't. But I, you know, I've seen, you know, I've seen a colony of plants that doesn't have any spines. Suddenly you'll see a pad or two that's got spines on it. They're probably hybridizing. Who the fuck knows? I didn't look at the genetic work. I didn't read the fucking paper. I just call it an opuncha. So whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. But come out here if you live in a region, snap a pad off, all right? I don't know if it's against rules and regs, but who gives a fuck? The whole, the whole place is almost a super fun site. Take a pad. You're not hurting the plant. Bring it to your backyard. You can propagate it there. How do they survive the winter? They just turn red, right? Those, those beta lane pigments, because we're talking order caryophyllales, same order as beets and spinach, uh, those beta lane pigments protect against heat, light, and freezing, just like anthocyanins do, anthocyanin pigments, in non-caryophyllales plants, okay? Beta lanes are specific to caryophyllales, they're a synapomorphia caryophyllales. Anyway, the fucking point is, they, they basically shrivel up, turn red, and just, you know, basically increase the sugar amount of their cells and get rid, uh, get rid of the water, and uh, that's why they wrinkle up like that, and then, um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, you got more, more diluted solids in the cells, 
so they can tolerate that freezing. You're basically lowering the freezing point of the inside of the tissue. So you come out here, these will turn red and all wrinkly and shit, you know, in the, the depths of January or February. Portulaca, all right, same order, Karyophyllales. It's got the beta lanes, it's got the succulents, same order as that cacti, uh, and it's got these little yellow flowers. This is a common weed, uh, it's invasive, but it's a cool plant. Supposedly it's edible if you're into that sort of thing. I'm not, and I certainly wouldn't eat anything that's growing here where you could see, look at this, you got, you got the old... Uh, seam asphalt from the concrete and then there's probably uh there's probably some old nostoc mixed in there too that cyanobacteria how about that hey, look they got spines sometimes look at those aerials see that a single spine coming out of there i would assume that seispitosa it's supposed to be but you know again did someone actually do genetic work on this i don't know could i have researched it before i came out here yeah but also i don't really care that much i'm just out here to check out the ecology of what's going on so you got these single spines and uh, these big juicy pads, obviously, they got rain recently. Ah, fuck. And, uh, and then, of course, you got those glockids right there in those individual aerials. Let's see. You got any glockids? Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. Those nice little hairs. Oh, Christ. Look at all the, look at all the, lots of cricket activity in here. Oh, look, you got a seedling germinating over there. A little, a little Opuntia seedling. Obviously enjoying its bed of uh, Nostoc communis, dormant Nostoc communis, and uh, decomposing, uh, Seam asphalt from the concrete. I think Louie's sick of this shit. You tired, Lou? You sick? Come on, let's go. Hey, Louie! Thought she was dead for a minute. No, come on. You just, I get you. I, you're... <laughs> Examples of secession. You know, you get the pioneer plants starting in the cracks. They slowly start to degrade it. They uh, concrete, make more room for other stuff to grow, as well as build soil using their old, you know, dead vegetative matter. And all that dead vegetation is how you build soil. And so, uh, and right here, we got a great example of how, look, you got a roost getting established. You got a sumac getting established in this colony of prickly pears, of native New York prickly pears. All right? A cactus grows in Brooklyn, you fuck. That's great. I'm going to shave off one of those little fruits, see what it tastes like. Man, maybe I will. I'll save it for later. The fruits can be covered in those little pain in the ass glockets, too. But again, they are edible. All right? You can get all juicy with them. You could make a little bomb or a lemonade or something. We go I shaved one of those fruits I shaved the skin off of it the beta lane pigment pigments that made the order Karyophyllales famous all right see that does it look like beets does it look like other fruits or that you know when you see this red pigment does it look like other stuff you see in this order you can see this in the leaves of uh, other species of amaranth etc sometimes that that same pink coloration it's not anthocyanins it's beta lanes now, except for two or three families all of order Karyophyllales Order of cactus, spinach, and beets produces that. Look how mucilaginous that goddamn fruit. Let's see what it tastes like. Probably not very good. You can see those disc-like seeds inside. All right. Unlike saguaro fruits, which are in a different subfamily of cactaceae, the cactus family. You know, the saguaro fruits have seeds in them that are little black poppy seeds. All the opuntioid, the prick, prickly pear seeds, and prickly pear subfamily seeds are little discs. Yeah, mildly sweet, mildly tart. Probably needs a few thousand years of human selection pressure to you know, turn this into a really choice edible fruit, but uh, it'll get the job done. You get a mammal, you know, coming by to eat that, even a bird, shit out some seeds, spit them out, get them around. Look how mucilaginous they are. They'll stick to uh, the substrate, maybe provide a little, seed, you know, temporary uh, snotty seed coat for it to germinate. And then, uh, you know, get some seeds germinating in these little, uh, these little moss beds or nostoc beds. Good to go. This fucking cactus, it's thriving. See this? Look, everywhere. It's just like, it's doing so well for itself. What's this, Saponaria officinalis? Another invasive. It's all right. You know, temporary until you can get some natives established. I mean, all these plants are going to be naturalized anyway, and something will eventually evolve, and uh, hopefully a native insect or fungus will, will uh, naturally evolve to keep them in check. It's just a question of how long. Could be 500,000 years, could be a million. And in that time period, with some invasive species, the question is how many other native species will they cause to go extinct? That's the problem with, with uh, invasives, you know? I mean, plants have been dispersed across oceans before, mostly by birds, you know, prior to humans. Uh, and But we don't know. Maybe it caused an extinction, whatever. But they eventually will naturalize. But now it's happening at such a rate, you know, thousands upon thousands of species in the last century or two that's where the problem comes in look at how fucking thick this is that's great take a couple pads take them back put them in put them in a fucking pot in your windowsill Ooh, that snot is all sticky now it dried on my hands put them in a pot on your windowsill 
put them in your yard, give them full sun. Make sure they're not overgrown and outcompeted. You get stuff growing over them, shading them out, they're gonna die. I mean, that's why they're thriving here. And they're, they're looking really plump and juicy. God damn, look at that massive colony of native New York prickly pear. This is nice. So look at this little bed of soil. You got the lichen showing up. Probably originally created by a prickly pear colony. God knows what else. You can see some invasive sedges mixed in with it down there. You see those little spikes. But it built the soil here. You've got the soils all coagulated together. All right, accreted together. It's formed a little mat now, and now you got lichens growing on it, holding it together. So this will become, and you see this on, on inselbergs, on granite inselbergs in places like South Africa and Brazil too, and even Western Australia, they form these little mats, even though it's rock below and they're not that thick, where other veg can grow, and that's what's happening here. So those are not tapping through the concrete, obviously. They're just growing in this little mat and hanging tight, and you get enough moisture here that it doesn't ever dry out too much. Uh, where they die and if it if it does dry out too much they could probably just go dormant maybe they got like a, a stocky root so this is anything that can tolerate the uh, occasion of potential drying out can grow here and lichens of course do it so well just like that nostoc commune they can uh, dry out completely and go dormant and then upon getting wet again they just uh you know green up come back to life that uh, fungus starts farming that algae again so how many different species of lichen right there is that two or three right there i don't know Nice stuff. You get a lot of nice stuff. Look at these fucking guys like walking around like they own the place. It's not your fault, buddy. It's ours. Look at this. We got a little Spurge, member of the Poinsettia family, Euphorbiaceae, in the genus Euphorbia, formerly in the genus Camasice. It's growing like a little mat. Look at the Nostoc, too. See the Nostoc there? Look at it. How it coagulates, just looking like dried nori or something. But again, it's slowly building soil, and these can fix nitrogen, and some plants will use Nostoc. You know, like species like uh, Gunnera and other species of cycad in their uh, in their tissues to help them get nitrogen out of the atmosphere too. Let's see, it's just drying out, coagulated. Get some rain; it'll green up. It's gonna rain the next few days. Be interesting to come out here and see you know see this turn into a mat of green snot. Yeah, two different species right here. Presumably, this one's got spines, but sometimes you'll see cladodes, those uh, little pads without spines. But if you look close at the uh the glockets coming out of those aerials they appear to be more of a golden color uh than uh this one than the humifusa with uh, a little bit more of an orange color and again when they're flowering you can see the yellow flower with the red center on the sage potosa and a yellow flower on humifusa just strictly yellow you see it's a tv it's a turkey vulture you can always tell it's a tv because they fly like they're drunk see how they're kind of wobbling jesus christ lay off the sauce buddy a friend of mine I uh, once did a drawing of a bunch of cartoon, tur cartoon turkey vultures getting hammered, drinking beers at a, at a bar once. Because I told them about that, how they kind of fly like that. You know, like they're kind of all wobbly and drunk and shit. And I enjoyed that. That place is probably filled with ticks out there. You know, probably got brought in by deer and rats and whatever. Let's go check it out. Oh, there we go. There's some nice Roos copalinum. Not to be confused, because it's similar in leaf to that uh, Atlantis altissima, the tree of heaven, which you can see is... Uh, so dominant uh, over there okay similar leaf structure but this is, of course anacardiaceae poison oak and sumac family this doesn't produce urushiol uh, like one third of the family does urushiol of course is what causes contact dermatitis but it evolved because it's possibly antifungal so uh you know whoop de doo it didn't have to do with us humans always forget that being uh anthropocentric that we are regardless cool to see a native going off here look at how look at how glabrous it is up it is up top look at those winged stems and uh, you get three species of roos, uh, what, Copalinum, uh, Typhena, and Glabra here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's Typhena, but you know, in the end, I don't really give a shit. I'll check later. I'm just making a video showing you what's going on here. You can see it's forming a nice colony too, as they tend to do. And the berries are all gone. Those flowers occur on this little panicle, you know, dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of tiny white flowers, important for the pollinators. And then the seeds, of course, are little red fruits, and uh, the birds go apeshit over them. So good for the birds. And over here we got Eliagnus umbellata, not native at all, totally invasive and it can be a bad one. I'd love to see it in its native uh, habitat over there in Asia, but we'll talk about it anyway because it's doing well here. It can tolerate the disturbance, the toxic soil and the uh, totally fucked up uh, human made environment and thrive. Notable about it are those, the texture of that fruit, see it looks like, looks like little scales on it. And then of course that velvet, that uh, those, those kind of little, trichomes or scales on the undersides of those leaves that give it that white abaxial surface abaxial just means leaf underside 
away from the axis. Ab axial leaf surface, and you look, you got those little scales on the top of the leaf too, but not as much because it needs, still needs to photosynthesize. But on the underside where all the stomata are, that's where the gas leaks out, where you're taking carbon dioxide in and uh, oxygen and water vapor uh, can be let out. And so uh, it's tolerant, again, of these these dry microcytes, because right, it can, it can prevent that moisture transpiration, evapotranspiration from its leaf stomata because it's got those bright white undersides and it is a beautiful plant. I'd rather admire it in its native habitat rather than here because some jackass let it loose out of horticulture, but still, you know, honorable mention, got to mention it. All right, it's, it's doing fine here on this uh, abandoned landing strip. Spot to dump some garbage, apparently. Hopefully that's not asbestos and hopefully it wasn't dumped by the mob. You know, someone takes a job uh, getting rid of some uh, waste. They offer a much lower rate than someone who's got to go through all the rules and regulations, etc. And uh, they just take a lower rate and then come dump it in a fucking abandoned airfield. Hopefully that's not what's going on. Could be though. Everything that's thriving here is thriving here for a reason. <clears throat> it's interesting to notice why they're doing so, whether it's a native or an invasive. What enables them to thrive amongst the garbage, the rampant asphalt, uh, the probably very toxic soil, etc. You know, what's going on with the, the, the roots that allow them to not suffer from any nutrient deficiencies other plants might uh, suffer from. In the case of Eliagnus, they have uh, actinomycete bacteria that help them fix nitrogen. Eliagnaceae is the family, Rosales is the order. Quite a, few, uh, quite a few members of this clade can do that. They can fix nitrogen. Okay, Ceanothus can do it too. Alders do it. They use that same actinomycete bacteria in the genus Frankia to do it. But uh, when we look at these berries, we can all see another reason why it's so widely dispersed and so invasive. The birds love them. The birds love them. Very conspicuous to a bird. Birds eat that fruit, shit out the seeds, and then it's got those white uh, abaxial leaf surfaces that make it a little bit more drought tolerant than other plants. So it can kind of grow as a chasmophyte, which is what uh, a lot of these plants are. They're plants that grow out of rocks. Like a chasmophyte is a plant that grows out of a rock. Generally, we're talking about it, you know, growing out of a rock. Uh, like a cliff face or a crack in a cliff face or a fucking boulder or something like that But you know it could also mean concrete. I suppose why not you know toxic concrete that used to be an old airstrip Why not here we go heterotheca heterotheca subaxillaris. It's another native Okay, and it's doing fine. It's doing fine. It's got mucilaginous uh, Tissues very snotty. It's got those those glands and hairs on the stem which enable it to do very well And uh, it's a late fall bloomer so, you know, you got to look at that too. The natives that do well in these kinds of environments are probably also invasive on other continents. Because again, if they can get, if a, if a native plant can survive in a city, especially a highly disturbed, fucked up area like an old airstrip or a super fun site, etc., there's probably a reason why. And those reasons that make it thrive here, even though it's native, will probably make it thrive, you know, 3,000 miles away on the other side of the ocean in an ecosystem it's never been introduced to until 100, 200 years ago by humans. And that's why, you know, genera like Solidago and Box Elder, et cetera, Lupinus, wonderful native genera in North America can be very, quote unquote, problematic in other continents. This guy's infamous. This is everywhere. Spotted knapweed. But we don't like to use common names because if you can memorize, if you can memorize a goofy ass common name, why not just memorize the genus name? You don't, remember, you don't need to memorize the whole goddamn you know, binomial name, just do the genus, all right? Centoria, Centoria stub in this case, from Italy, all right? It's a thistle from Italy. Thistle just means cardioid subfamily, cardioidae. And this is, again, Centoria stub. Look at those five petals, those five elongated uh, fused corolla lobes. I guess you can call them petals, coming out of those individual florets that compose this flower head. You got your pink fused anther tubes and your white styles poking out of there. And then kind of an attractive rosette of basil leaves but it is an invader it could be a real pain in the ass it can out compete natives uh it didn't evolve with any of the pollinators here regardless it's got an edge in and uh, it's doing well and then look at that very distinct shape to that involucre okay that's like the think of it the vase that holds the flowers in the uh, members of the asteraceae the sunflower family and those phyleries have uh those kind of uh, uh ciliate margins to them see that like little frilly shits on the margins of those phyleries yeah, but it's just growing out of old asphalt here at the fucking you know, Floyd Bennett Airport. And over here, growing at this crack in the concrete, we got little blue stem, the, the famous little blue stem, wonderful native grass, thriving here. Of course it is, so tolerant of the dry conditions. It's got that C4 photosynthesis as opposed to C3, which uh, most plants have, but the grasses do that C4 thing, which enables them to tolerate hotter, drier conditions. And you got these 
notorious inflorescences, all right? Very conspicuous, easy to remember, and you got that purple coloration at the base of the stem, okay? Grasses can be hard. You just got to, you know, you just got to make sure you're looking at the right. It's like any plant from you got to make sure you're looking at the right aspects of the morphology. See, and there's those those seeds with those plumosons uh, coming off. So this is great to see this diving here. Anyway, I'm going to cut it short there unless I find something else cool. This has already been a long fucking video. Hopefully uh, you got something out of that. But here we are. I mean, it's, it's fucking New York City. It's Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, you could still you could still go out and study the landscape, learn a couple things, get a you know better perspective on everything. Zoom out. It can help your ass philosophically figure out where you fit into the world. You know, you get a little bit of uh, perspective on shit. And, uh, you know, end up studying other things. You're going to get into plants. You're going to eventually gonna end up getting into a geology, organic chemistry, fucking insects, whatever. It's all a pleasant respite. From how fucking ugly human beings and modern civilization specifically have made the current world in this uh, late stage capitalist hellscape that we all uh, exist in here especially in the united states so uh anyway but look you don't even need to think about all that we don't got to get all negative that's just me look at a saladago semper semperverans it's another wonderful native the golden rats all right there's no excuse for just doom scrolling on your phone looking at dumb shit that just makes you dumber or more depressed come out here look at this stuff okay don't get dumber and more depressed. We don't need any more of that. Plenty of reasons to be, but don't do that, all right? Come out here and get stuck. That's all I got. Have a good day. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Come on, let's go.